right, we are still fresh off the heels of JJK261, but you guys already got a lot of questions, and I don't blame you. So let's get into it, but spoilers beware. Alrighty, y'all, one last thing before we dig in here. Obviously, this chapter was crazy and begged a lot of questions, and a lot of these questions I got are very similar from people. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these one by one, but if we happen to get to one where I've already kind of answered it from a previous question, thank you so much for the support, and I'm just going to keep moving. So no disrespect. I hope that doesn't offend anybody, but I just don't want to bore anybody by saying the same thing several times. Anyways, with that out of the way, Let's get into it. And this first one from Bep here is some questions regarding Yuta. As always, pause to read the whole thing if you'd like to. But the first thing up here says, do I think it's possible for Yuta re to return to his own body after being transplanted in Gojo? Or might he just stay as Gojo? And this is a big question, right? This was kind of the thing that was presented to us in the chapter. There are basically three options depending on how Kenjaku swap works. Now, what we know is that in the past, Kenjaku has swapped multiple times. So presumably, Kenjaku himself kept and maintained the copy even after losing his original body. So Yuta Okotsu should theoretically be able to do the same thing and then could theoretically hop back into his own body. However, his own body may not be around anymore. He was looking really rough and they didn't think that they could heal him, it seemed like. But maybe they could, you know? We just don't really have enough information. And then even beyond that issue is the whole issue of this five-minute timer, right? Yuta may not even get that chance because after five minutes, for all we know, he could just drop, you know, and just be done because of the nature of how his copy works. So really, this is a big question mark and we don't know. So I can't give you a better answer than that. But I think anything is on the table. And to follow up there on what do I think about him losing his copy technique? Um, I could see that being a likely outcome where after the five minutes, he's okay. But now he's just trapped in Gojo's body forever, and he'll only have the Limitless as opposed to having the copy and everything else. Same with Rika. We didn't see her this chapter, and I'm very curious what that relationship is like. Is she still around? Is she still connected to Okotsu via Gojo now, or did Rika pass away when his body passed away? We don't know. So, um, yeah, I apologize for not being able to give you a more concrete answer, but Honestly, I think everything is on the table, and this is like an intentional big mystery that Gege has kind of left us with as this cliffhanger. Next up, we got this question from a story up here that talks about this potential of Gojo basically overpowering Akotsu and taking his own body back. With the evidence for this being kind of that moment from Shibuya where, you know, the spirit of Geto chokes Kenjaku in his body and there's just precedent for, you know, both Toji taking over the grandson with the seance technique, even though that's not the same thing here. Uh, but there is precedent for this, right? So I, I think it's possible sure especially after this five minutes is up if nothing else like could there be some wiggle room for gojo to do something and again i think it's possible but i wouldn't like you know put all your hopes on that if you saw my video uh the one i put out before this one i kind of talk about my reaction to 261 and in that video i talk about this room for gojo to do something still to have this character development and I do expect to see something in that regard, but I don't really expect to see like Gojo fully take back over and just have full autonomy and like as if he was alive again. Now, maybe he'll take over control for a moment and be able to do something, but I just don't see it being like a long term Gojo is back type of solution. And then next up from Banana down here is talking about Gojo and RCT. Again, y'all pause to read the whole thing. But Banana, in my opinion, it was never a question of Gojo not being able to do RCT because his stomach was wounded or whatever. Um, I always thought that Gojo, assuming he had the help and the resources, would be able to perform RCT still, even though he had been, you know, bisected. So I think what happened there and why Yuta was able to heal himself in Gojo's body while Gojo didn't do that himself is because Gojo had likely already passed away. Like, it was too late. If Gojo had been in a position where he theoretically was able to heal, then I too think he would have been able to heal himself just like we saw Okotsu do in his body. And then next up, we got three questions in the similar vein from Tommy, Isaac, and Lakis. And thank you guys so much. And I basically did talk about these things already. But again, I do see that Toji slash Geto situation as an interesting precedent that creates room for Gojo to do something, but I just don't see it as a long-term solution. 
Next up from Twinticles, he wants to know if Gojo wouldn't want his students to become a monster like him, do I think it's possible that during Akotsu's battle, he could somehow intervene? And yes, I think this would be really cool if this is how this manifests. Similar to how Geto choked Kenjaku, maybe Gojo could somehow do something to influence Akotsu and try to save him from making the same mistakes that he did. And again, if you didn't see my previous video talking about my reaction to 261, I talk about that way more at length so check that out and then gojivon here says since yuda used infinite void by using kenjaku's technique would that mean kenjaku's open domain was from ghetto and we don't know we simply just don't have enough information to answer that fully um, because kenjaku is such a specific use case the fact that he swaps bodies we really don't understand what that means it could certainly mean that that was ghetto's domain expansion but I fully believe that Kenjaku could probably use multiple domains, but the question then becomes, is he just imbuing different techniques into the barrier, like we saw Okotsu do with Jacob's Ladder, or are these distinct different domains based on the bodies that he possessed? So we don't know. So the fact that Okotsu used infinite voids tends to lend to the idea that he has to use the domain of the body he's in, um, but still, maybe he could imbue a different technique into it if he wants. But yeah, I'm kind of yapping here, but really we don't have enough information yet. But I think it's certainly possible that the infinite womb profusion or whatever it was called was Ghetto's innate domain. And then for the second part of your question about this binding vow between Sukuna and Kenjaku, I too am very curious about that. It seems like at least part of it was for Sukuna to carry on Kenjaku's will and enact the merger if something were to happen to him, but I do feel like there's other things from that vow that we don't know yet. Next up, we got this great breakdown from Omen. Let me move out of the way for anybody that wants to pause and read it, but it deals with this five-minute time limit and what could happen after that. Could Gojo come back? And these are things we've largely already talked about, so I'm going to move on to the next one. But again, Omen, thank you so much for the support. Next up, we got two similar questions here from Eric and from Jojo on basically how Okotsu is able to use Infinite Void. And we talked a little bit about this, and there's still just too many unknowns with exactly how the swap works, but clearly Okotsu's casting Infinite Void, right? And I think that's because he's in Gojo's body, and we know that the technique is engraved on the body, as well as the brain, however you want to like think about that, because again, we've seen Kenjaku use techniques that aren't even from the body he's currently in, and presumably he he keeps his same brain every time so just somehow by nature of how this technique works he gets access to those things now how is Akotsu like able to do this having just been in Gojo's body I think it could be due to the fact they share a bloodline like Eric mentions here but also it could be that they trained specifically for this it's even possible that uh, Akotsu and Gojo were the swap during the time skip in order to prepare for this plan since this was a plan that they you know were planning for how many times did I just say the word plan so I think it could be the bloodline it could be that they swapped and particularly trained for this or it could just be a product of getting access to all of the memories of the host which we know Kinjaku does because he knows all of Ghetto's memories right Next up, we got this question from Sam, which is in the exact same vein. And unfortunately, I just think we need more information. But yeah, clearly the body swap technique grants you access to that body's domain. Now, whether you have access to your original domain or other domains in the case of Kenjaku, we still have to see. Next up, we got this really interesting idea from Anthony who wonders if Kenjaku could perhaps hijack this gojo Yuta hybrid. And like, you know, maybe there's just more to this technique than we even understand, and this could be a path for him to come back. So I've mentioned before that I do think we could see Kenjaku again. Um, I wouldn't necessarily think this would be the way it happens, but that would certainly be crazy. Next up, we got this one from I'm Jay, and it is stuff we've already talked about. So thank you so much, man. Next up, we got this question from Velo, who thinks we'll get the answer to Ghetto's question to Gojo via seeing Yuta not be able to use the Six Eyes and Limitless as well as Gojo could, meaning he was strong because he was him. So that would certainly be interesting. I do expect Yuta to fail, so that could be an element of something Gege wants to explore as that happens. 
Next up, Talon asks if I think there's a possibility that Yuta copied all of Kenjaku's curse techniques, including curse spirit manipulation. And I think yes, I think he would have copied all of the techniques in Kenjaku's brain. It's really just a question of what does he have access to right now during these five minutes that he swapped? Can he do everything he's learned or is he limited? So if he has everything, then I think he could theoretically Uzumaki Rika. And then Acoustic King down here brought up something that I too have been wondering. Can Yuta control who is targeted by Unlimited Void? Something Gojo could not do. But we know that Akotsu could specifically target within his domain because we saw him do so when he used it against Sukuna, only targeting Sukuna with the sure hit effect. So I hope that's the case. Like, And it would make sense, again, given that precedent. But it could also be that Akotsu just doesn't give a shit. He's gone full monster and he's just trying to take out Sukuna. But... I would guess that he can target it because Yuji and Toto are still like right there, right? So they are presumably in danger of both this Malevolent Shrine and the Infinite Void. So very curious to see how this plays out. Next up, we got a couple questions from Tim here. I'm going to move out of the way for y'all to read. This top one, we've pretty much already covered, but this bottom one I want to specifically talk about because he wants to know what I think Yuji's reaction to this will be. And I think that's going to be really interesting because we didn't see Yuji in any of those flashbacks. So I think they intentionally kept this plan from Yuji, probably for a similar reason that Toto kept his plan from Yuji. They were worried about this soul resonance and they just didn't want Sukuna to have any idea that this was on the table. But on top of that, I don't think Yuji would have let this fly. Now, not that he would have been able to stop it, and other people did voice their concerns about this plan, but I think Yuji in particular would have been really against this. So I think he's going to be shocked by this. Um, it's hard to say like how much room there's going to be for emotion in the moment because they are still fighting right now. So he's really not going to have time to process this, but I think it's going to rattle him. I mean, if it's really sad to think about too, because probably from his perspective, he's going to think Gojo actually just came back. So when he realizes that, you know, his sensei is actually being puppeted as a weapon, you know, I'm sure he'll understand why Akotsu did it, but yeah, I don't think he's going to be happy about it. And finally, we have a couple questions here from Cosmic Swine. The first one dealing with Nobara and wondering if the sugar curse technique guy could help her come back. And I do think uh, Nobara comeback is on the table. I've talked about it uh, before, so I could see something like that happening, especially in reference to your second question, which we're going to get to, which talks about the only one will die or only one will live theory. But more on that in a second. Uh, specifically about Sugar Boy, I agree that it feels like there's going to be something more from him. Now, whether that's helping Nobara come back or, you know, anything with Akotsu and Gojo or just whoever, I don't know. But it seems like you didn't need to introduce him just to explain, like, Shoko doing a better job. Because, like, that's the explanation we were given so far. Like, he's sitting there pumping sugar into their brains to, like, keep them going longer, basically, is how I understand it. And I just don't think, like, Gege needed to add that if that's all it was. So I'm very curious to see if another shoe does drop with that. And then for the only one will live or only one will die stuff, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, I highly recommend you go watch a video. I put it out, I think last week. It shouldn't be too far back on whatever platform you're watching on. But it's about this quote that Gege gave saying, of the four main characters being Gojo, Megami, Yuji, and Nobra, the ending will either entail all of them dying except one, so one of the four survives, or all of them living except one, so only one of the four dies. And given where we are now with at least presumably Gojo presumed gone at this point, um, that opens up some interesting possibilities, right? Because if only one were to pass away, then we know that that's probably Gojo now. And again, citing back to Nobra, if we assume that she's actually not coming back, then that means we know either Yuji or Megami will also pass away because only one's going to survive. So... I think it's too really vague still to make any definite statements. The only thing I'm like the most comfortable with is saying that Gojo's probably not going to come back, at least not long term for good. I again do think there's a window for him to come back and, and do something, have some character development, um, but just not permanently. So I, I would imagine that we are, I don't know, I, it's just tough. I don't think we have enough information yet, but 
to circle this all the way back around, I do still think it's possible for Nobro to show up again, and I'm expecting something from Sugar Boy. And y'all, that's going to do it for this one. Thank you so much for the support. It means more than you'll know. And I hope my two cents helped a little bit, even though, you know, a lot of this is still a mystery right now. But please let me know y'all's thoughts down in the comments. And thank you so much for watching.